Thank you all for being here and watching the program. Uh, it's your interest in the Roach Jones Duff House and my art that makes this all matter at all. So thank you for your curiosity and thank you for joining in. Um, what I propose to do tonight is give you an introduction to my work in general and then uh, delve into behind the scenes of how some of the artwork that'll be in the exhibit was made. Uh, so I, as a visual artist, I'm primarily a painter, but the canvas I paint on is not blank. Instead, I've developed a technique for painting on vintage and antique photographs that serve as my canvas and the inspiration for my art. Okay, and I'm wanting my slides to move forward now. Uh, let's see, sorry. Huh. Aha. <laughs> so these vintage photographs uh, can be found languishing in attics and basements, maybe even your own. And you may realize that they, they can have a very personal connection for the families and friends of the person who posed for the camera. You may be able to pick up a photograph at home and say, you know, there's my grandfather when he was a child. Or remember Lily when she had that curly blonde hair. Well, by the time I find these photographs, those sorts of personal connections are lost. Uh, families have given them away or put them in antique stores and I recover them from the anonymity of being in these uh, piles and antique stores and so forth. Um, but I don't preserve them like a conservator. Instead, I collaborate with each photograph to create something new with the old. So here's an example of three photographs in their original state in which I found them up above and what they look like after I painted on them down below. Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, when these character, the, the people who pose for the camera, when, when, they're, when they become anonymous, um, they're kind of freed to become characters in a new scenario, recast, costumed, um, however I want. <laughs> and the, the photographs also are easier to see as objects, and it's also easier to see the composition of the image as well. They're still very evocative, obviously, but the per personal connection is lost, and there's a sense of freeing that comes with that. So as you can see, sometimes I use a lot of color in uh, painting on the photographs, and other times, like in the middle, the image with the snow and the horses, I work hard to mix paint colors that match those of the photograph. Um, you know, the subtle sepia tones or black and white. And you might think, oh, I can mix a bunch of uh, sepia tone paint and use it for several photographs. But it doesn't work that way. It's kind of amazing how each photograph has very different color tones, even if it might just be in the range of sepia. But what happens when I do that, when I paint like the horse into the snow scene and keep the colors the same as the photo is that it becomes a little more difficult perhaps to see what's added and what was original. Most of the work I made for the Roach Jones Duff House is monochromatic like that. And so hopefully you'll have fun figuring out what things were added and what was original to the photographs. Before I start painting the photo, I spend tons of time sketching out ideas. Uh, and, you know, these photos are small and they're basically one of a kind. So I want to get it right. Um, sometimes my ideas come to fruition, sometimes they don't, but I work things out a lot ahead of time before I bring the photograph to my easel where I paint on it. And these are very small images, you know, they're about five by seven inches or so. And I'm trying to paint really realistically. So it looks as if the thing I'm painting could have been in the photo. Um, so I'm making these little miniature paintings. And when I paint, 
I cancel part of the images, part of the original photograph, and conjure additional illusions of possible and impossible scenarios, things the camera did not or could not have recorded. People often ask how I decide what to paint on old photographs, and that follows two basic routes. One, um, sometimes a photograph triggers an idea. So I'll be looking very carefully at these old evocative images, and maybe, maybe it's an expression on a face or a, a gesture of a body or a prop in the background that triggers an idea of that gets me started sketching as to what I could paint on that photo. Other times I come to my big photo collection with an idea in mind, something I want to explore. And then I look through all the photos, imagining those that could help me explore that idea. But every time I paint on a photograph, I'm responding to that photograph as well. In much of my work, I merge kind of double responses where it's a response to the photograph, but also to something specific that's already out there in the world. This is an example of that, the painting by Marcel Duchamp on the left, and then my copy of it, very miniature. This piece is probably about two by four inches in total. Uh, and, and it's when I do that, especially with a historic painting um, like the Duchamp, I'm, I'm studying that historic painting and in a way honoring it, but I'm also subverting the context, putting it in a new uh, environment inside the photo, such as behind this dapper young man. Here's another example of that. Uh, on the left is a section of a fresco painted into a huge dome of a cathedral um, by the artist Correggio. And you can see I, I took just a part of that fresco and put it behind this woman watering her garden. And so in that image, the artwork that I painted, uh, I've changed the photo, like that woman watering her garden is, is suddenly not just a woman watering her garden. <laughs> and the painting by Correggio is now connected with her somehow. So I've taken this idea of responding to something that already exists to, uh, to include responses to poems and fiction. So this diptych, for example, is my reply to a poem by Jory Graham. And I was really lucky when I got to experience that responsive process in reverse. So this, this piece was exhibited in a show where authors were invited to write in response to my art. And I'd never experienced that before, and it kind of blew me away. So the author, Hollis Seaman, wrote this amazing piece of flash fiction. It's just three to 500 words long. But she imagines a scenario that had never crossed my mind when I made the artwork. She imagines this conversation between the person in the photograph and the photographer, who is her daughter, and they're having this kind of intense conversation while the photograph is being made, just before the camera is clicked and the film is exposed. So th this was really interesting to me, how my artwork exists on its own and that story on its own, it doesn't need my artwork to be provocative, it's, it's really great. But then you bring the two together and a third structure forms, a new expressions and meanings arise out of this pairing. And, and that was great. It's not exactly collaboration, but being able to work with some other creative and create this third thing with our, our two different works, I wanted more of that. So I took the initiative and invited a bunch of authors to write in response to my art. And I'm very lucky and grateful that they did. 
And that is what's resulted in the book that Dawn mentioned, then again, Vintage Photography Reimagined by One Artist and 31 Writers. So this anthology uh, is organized uh, by chapter and each chapter shows an image of my artwork and the corresponding uh, story or poem that was written in response to it. And it's, this is related to an ancient practice of ekphrastic writing where uh, poets wrote about an artwork, but this does so much more than just describe the artwork. The story becomes an addition to the artwork, a reimagining, a building on or digging into, and vice versa, the artwork affects the story when they're paired together and they also create this third thing. So it was natural for me uh, in planning an exhibit for the Roach Jones Duff House to imagine creating artwork in response to this fantastic house, its history and its collections. And when uh, <clears throat> some of you may not know much about the Roach Jones Duff House, so I'll fill you in briefly. It was built in 1834 for a whaling merchant, uh, William Roach Jr. He and his family lived there until 1851. And then it was bought uh, by the Jones family. And they lived there quite a long time from 1851 to 1935. And then in 1935, the third family moved in the Duff family, and they lived there until 1981. So for almost 150 years, this was a family home. And then in the mid eighties, it became a museum. Um, but I just imagine if these walls could tell us the stories of things that happened there, the private anguish, the passion, the public celebrations, and even just the fashions I mean, imagine the Roach women and what they wore compared to the Duff women in the 20th century and how the status of, woman had, of women had changed during that time too. So that, uh, some of the work I made for this exhibit um, explores a kind of a general theme of the 19th century life or 19th compared to 20th century life. And I kind of dug into this idea of fashion for a couple pieces. So I found this photograph. Um, the woman in white is so obviously wearing a corset and you know tight sleeves and big skirt. And as uh, you know, <clears throat> growing up in the '70s, I'm all about loose, comfortable clothing. And all I can think of when I think of wearing a corset is out. Um, and so I imagine you know the Roach women and the uh, Jones women dressing kind of like this and, and the expectations of women from culture during that time as well versus the Duff women in the 1970s. So you can see some of my sketches. I was thinking of the disco era and feminism, I have a couple of references to the Gorilla Girls, which actually didn't make it into the final cut, but uh, that's sometimes what happens with brainstorming. Um, and here's, you'll get a sense of what I did with this photograph in the next picture. So there's the photograph on my easel and my reference images around it. Um, so you can see I found some things from the 70s, like the poster of Farrah Fawcett, um, over in the lower right, a Barbie doll and a lava lamp for fun. Um, and so, you know, yes, much more free <laughs> uh, in a sense of fashion. But, and, and, and of course women, you know, had the right to vote in the 1970s and much more freedom, but Barbie still had high heel feet. So it wasn't all solved. But I wanted to kind of show this comparison. But the other reason I wanna show you this slide is to talk a little bit about how I make a, pair, a painting. So if you look carefully at the woman in white and above her shoulder, you can probably find two diagonal strokes of paint. That's the first bits of paint I've put on the photograph. But before I did that, I drew out where I wanted things to go. 
and you might be able to make out some light lines just above those two diagonal stripes. Also on the floor below some light lines. Um, when I start a painting, I block things in really fast, just finding the really basic shapes of light and dark. And it's a rewarding part of the process. It goes by um, pretty quickly. Not quite this quickly. But I do look to, uh, within the first few times I work on a photograph, to figure out where everything's basically going to go. And then it's kind of rewarding. It's like, oh, and now it's a, it's a work of art. It's changed the photograph already. And then gradually, I get smaller and, and uh, more specific with the details as I move along with the painting. So uh, perhaps you'd like to see how this painting turned out in the end. And I'll show you that along with another painting along the same theme. Uh, another thing that really obviously changed between the 19th century and the 20th century is hairstyles. So I also looked really specifically at uh, aspects of the Roach family and the Jones family and the house as well in my responses uh, to the mansion. Um, here you see one of the rooms in the Roach Jones Duff house. It's set up almost as a traditional museum display as opposed to a living space. Um, this is the Roach room where you can learn about William Roach Jr. and his Quaker heritage and his family. Um, I was drawn to the Quaker style silhouette portrait that you can see over on the left. Um, where he's standing and in, in, in profile there. And I looked around and found that the Whaling Museum in New Bedford had in their collection more silhouette portraits of Roach family members. Uh, looking at the Whaling Museum, I also learned a lot about whales and whaling. Um, the whaling industry is why New Bedford was the most wealthy city in the nation in the 19th century. And it's, it's why the Roach Jones Duff House was able to be built in the first place, profits from the whaling industry. So I wanted to somehow honor the sacrifice of the whales as well as the family who, who uh, had the home built. Um, so I collected uh, portraits of the different members of the Roach family and also images of whales. Uh, the two most two of the most commonly hunted whales were the sperm whale and the right whale. And here you can see, similar to the past setup, uh, the old photograph on my easel surrounded by my reference material. On the left is the tracing paper I used to trace where I wanted to hang the uh, silhouette portraits in the photo of the, of the little girl. Um, I chose this photo uh, for a few reasons. Um, the, the little girl in the photograph is anonymous. I don't know who she is, but we do know one thing about her. When she was posing for the camera, she was doing so in a New Bedford photo studio. And I don't know if you can make it out in this slide, but way down at the bottom, that text, has this uh, photo studio name and says New Bedford Mass below that. Um, also, this uh, compositionally and, and, and in a formal sense, this photograph kind of conveniently has this wall behind it and I wanted to hang these silhouette portraits there. Uh, this is the artwork in progress where I've mapped out where things are gonna go and I haven't yet gotten to the details. And here's the finished piece. So you can see in the upper left, remember that uh, silhouette uh, standing profile of William Roach Jr. and, uh, and other uh, Roach family members are there as well. And then above the little girl's head is a silhouette of a right whale. Between that right whale and William Roach Jr. is another whale portrait. And then straight below that, 
two of the lowest silhouettes are of sperm whales. And then if you look carefully at the, near, at the floor near the little girl's feet, you'll hopefully be able to see a few other surprises. So a little bit more about the history of the house is interesting here. Um, the Roach family sold the house in 1851 and the Jones family moved in and they have a really interesting story. Um, Edward Jones and his wife moved in in 1851 with three very young girls. And then things changed dramatically in a year. Um, soon after they moved in, they had a fourth daughter but soon after she was born, the mother and the eldest daughter died of scarlet fever. So the remaining three daughters were raised by Edward Jones and fortunately a very helpful uh, <clears throat> domestic staff person who stayed on for 20 years and helped raise the daughters. But the daughters as women in the mid and late 19th century are a pretty interesting group as well. Um, there are portraits down below here over on the far right is the youngest, who was an infant when her mother died, Sarah Jones. In some ways, she had a pretty typical life for a, a 19th century woman. She grew up, got married, had kids, but didn't see her 40th year. Um, on the far left is Amelia Jones. And she is a very striking woman in this in this story. Um, after her father died, she remained as head of the household, a single woman her whole life. She generously gave to the city of New Bedford from the wealth of the family. She treated her domestic servants well, and she wrote a lot. And it's one of the reasons that we know so much about the Jones family and the house during that time. And then there's Emma Jones in the middle here. <clears throat> Emma was about four or five years old when her mother and older sister died. And as she grew up, she had a lot of challenges, um, physical, possibly psychological challenges. She was also really creative and an excellent craftsperson. She made this needlework sampler uh, when she was an adult. Uh, you can see the date in the lower left, 1909. Up in the middle near the top are her initials, Emma Coffin Jones. And it's just so beautiful in so many ways. I love the floral pattern up above. And I'm curious about the geese. Like sure, geese are a common bird, but these geese aren't just standing on a shore. They're in this really active pose, taking off from the water into the sky. And then this phrase, little strokes fell great oaks, which I get. You might wanna keep that in mind if you're doing some needlework, each little stitch getting you closer to the finished piece. You know, I get the idea of breaking down a complex big task into small parts, but I wanted, I didn't like the destructiveness of the phrase and I wanted to reform it into something uh, more creative or constructive, which I tried to do. So on this also a uh, photograph from a New Bedford studio, I don't know if you can read it, but my, my rephrasing of little, uh, little strokes fell great oaks is little brush strokes paint new pictures. Um, again, you can see my reference imagery all around. And I hope in, in this one, if you can't see it here, you'll be able to in person. Behind the gentleman, the four geese are represented, the one in front of him, but the three in the back and the waves and water, I tried to paint as Trump Loy cross stitch as if they were made of cross stitch as well. So in addition to the family members who lived in the house, uh, a lot of other people lived there too. And I was thinking of the domestic staff and what their lives may have been like. We don't know a lot about them. In family ledgers, there's notes about hiring so-and-so and letting go the other so-and-so. 
Um, but I tried to imagine what their lives might have been like. And at the Roadstone Stuff House, there's some tools they may have used. Like in the lower right here, you can see the mortar and pestle, a warming plate and some other tools. That thing on the far right in the acrylic cube is an iron. Um, up above is a detail of the photograph that I painted on uh, to explore this a little more. And of course my sketch is over on the left. And this is the finished piece. The houses may be weighing sometimes uncomfortably on their heads. The iron uh, from the Roach Jones Duff House is down below, as is the mortar and pestle, and also a wash tub and a broom. Another uh, display item at the Roach Jones Duff House that I responded to is the tall case clock on the second floor. And this on, on the right, you can see my painting in progress and up above some uh, reference photos. This is the finished work. And this is really a response to multiple things that have to do with the Roach Jones Duff House. Um, I, I had read that the Jones girls themselves had together read some writings by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And since I had in, in my practice uh, a sense of responding to fiction and poetry, I just sort of kept in the back of my head, oh, maybe I'll come across something Longfellow that I could respond to. And uh, of course I did. Um, I came across this poem about a grandfather clock and it's chiming. And so this piece is made in response to the Longfellow poem, to the tall case clock um, in the Roach Jones Duff House, to this kind of amazingly evocative portrait of this woman who's, when I found it, she's already fading away into lightness. And if you'll indulge me, so you get the idea of this poem, I'll read just a few stanzas for you. Is that okay? I can't see you. So I'm just gonna assume it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, go for okay. it. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> there groups of merry children played. There youths and maidens dreaming strayed. O precious hours, O golden prime, and affluence of love and time. Even as a miser counts his gold, those hours the ancient timepiece told. Forever, never, never, forever. From that chamber clothed in white, the bride came forth on her wedding night. There in that silent room below, the dead lay in his shroud of snow. And in the hush that followed the prayer was heard the old clock on the stair, forever, never, never, forever. All are scattered now and fled. Some are married, some are dead. And when I ask with throbs of pain, ah, when shall they all meet again? as in the days long since gone by, the ancient timepiece makes reply, forever, never, never, forever. Thank you for indulging me in that. Um, one reason I liked the poem is because I think of it as it, it's uh, referring to the clock in a way similar to I was, how I was thinking of the house, kind of holding all these different things through time and all in one space. Uh, there's a couple rooms of the house uh, I was particularly drawn to. Um, this is the dining room and it's uh, fantastic for several reasons. Uh, one, it uh, has aspects from all three families, um, but I was particularly drawn to the wallpaper. Uh, I'll give you, I'll show you some details here. It's, it's this fanciful Asian looking wallpaper with blooming trees 
flitting birds and insects and rocks and water. And I can just imagine being a child, you know, eating in this dining room and, and spending an afternoon here perhaps and imagining it coming to life. Well, I didn't have to be a child <laughs> there to imagine it, turns out. Um, another room I really enjoyed is one of these grand living rooms. It similarly <clears throat> uh, brings together references of many eras of the house. Uh, so, uh, you know, of course the house was built by the Roach family. Um, this beautiful painting, The Carpenter's Son in the gold frame above the piano is connected with the Jones family. And it's a fantastic story to read about, which I'll uh, let you find when you come visit the house in person. And uh, the floor was put in by the Duff family, for instance. Um, but this room also shows that it's a museum now. Um, there's the text uh, telling the story about the painting and the chair has that ribbon on it. So you can't just sit down in it as you would your own living room. Um, and in my mind, I imagine this house in its fifth era right now. So there's the three families, Roach, Jones and Duff, three eras. And then the house became a museum, the fourth era. And now I imagine with Don Salerno as the director, it's in a kind of fifth era. And I think this is the first, the the first time that uh, an artist has been invited to have a solo show in the house. So that's sort of going in with the fifth era too. And I wanted to make a complex artwork that spoke to that in some way. I found a photograph and I took some pictures at the house. Dawn was very nice to uh, pose for me. Um, I chose this photograph for a couple reasons. Um, thinking of the passage of time and how uh, people perceive time when they're different ages, uh, compared to my midlife understanding of time, this girl in the photograph has a very different understanding of time. Things are, are new. Um, she doesn't even necessarily know yet that summer will come again the following year. But she's looking so straight out at us, the viewers. Um, the chair she's standing on seems to fit in with some of the uh, furniture at the Roach Jones Duff House. And then the photographer left me that all that space around her that I could use to make a painting in. So I worked and sketched and gathered references. And then I painted. Um, this painting started out very much like the one you saw with the Farrah Fawcett poster in the background. Uh, but now it's, it's in what I'm about to show you, it's moved along to much more detailed uh, stage of painting and I'll show you what that can look like. And it really is just one little dot or mark at a time. And I have to stand back and see how it's working and step forward and change it. it is, not nearly as fast as uh, the stage of painting in the beginning of a painting. Um, but I did make it through and finished the painting. And this painting presents pictures within pictures within pictures. So there's our little girl staring right out at us. And behind her is this beautiful timepiece on the mantle of the fireplace. And then behind the, the timepiece is the mirror with a reflection of dawn and also a reflection of that painting, The Carpenter's Son. And over to the right uh, below the window is this artwork. And in that artwork is this little girl 
looking right out at us and behind her the timepiece and behind that the mirror and reflecting dawn and so forth. So you've had a chance to see a little bit behind the scenes of uh, my artwork and the exhibit at the Roach Jones Deaf House. Um, I'm curious to see what it will be like to have my artwork in the house. Will it create a kind of third structure, a new set of meaning, meanings, like when my artwork is paired with a poem or story written in response? Um, but I'm happy now to uh, answer some questions you might have. Uh, and I think Dawn is going to go ahead and coordinate that. Yes, thank you so much, Laura. And, um, and you've actually already set it up for us. So um, at this point, um, I feel like we should all unmute and, and clap or snap. Maybe snapping is better. Um, <laughs> snapping is better for this kind of thing because it's quieter. Yeah, there you go. Clapping's a little loud for Zoom. Um, but please, uh, I mean, I, I could probably ask five questions, but uh, I'll have my chance to next week. So uh, does anyone have a question? If you'd like to unmute and ask it personally, please do. And um, you're also welcome to throw it in the chat and I will read it aloud. Um, but I hope we have some curious people out there. 